I talked to the pastor last week after he uh, after he was finished Jesse, and he said that the church was so prepared to worship from the minute he came in. He could feel a sense. He told me that God was moving mightily, and uh, that's a testament to what I've known for a long time and what you, Kyra, shared. And that this church is a church that wants to see God move mightily, and we just, uh, you know, what we threw a softball up there, and God allowed him to hit a home run with it. So. It was an unbelievable service and an unbelievable, just part of what God is doing. Now I want to tell you about a story about D.L. Moody. One of the men who most influenced him, D.L. Moody, was a young preacher named Henry Morehouse. Some of you have maybe read some of his sermons, read his writings, a fairly famous pastor himself. He once preached, though, for Moody for an entire week using the same text every night. That text was John 3.16. <coughs> the preaching of Morehouse, according to D.L. Moody, was much different from his own. Instead of preaching that God was behind people with a double-edged sword to hew them down, he told them God wanted every person to be saved because he loved them. Moody said of his preaching, I didn't know God thought so much of me. It was, his, it was wonderful to hear the way he brought out Scripture. He went from Genesis to Revelation and preached that in all ages God loved the sinner. In closing the final service of that series, Morehouse said, for seven nights, I have been trying to tell you how much God loves you, and this poor stammering tongue of mine will not let me. If I could ascend Jacob's ladder and ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Almighty, to tell you how much love that God the Father has for this poor lost world, all that Gabriel could say is, quote John 3.16. And so in Malachi, where we're going to start today, this is an incredible passage. Now, I want you to understand the text and the context of Malachi because it helps us understand what God has done. Now, He's raised up prophet after prophet, leader after leader for an entire testament, thousands of years. And He's talked to the people. He's helped them. He's carried them. He's delivered them. He's brought them out of exile, not just in Egypt, but again in Babylon. Now this is post-exilic, which means simply that it's after the second exile, God delivers them again from Babylon back to Israel, back to the where they planned to be, and He has delivered them again to the promised land that He hoped for them and always given to them to have. And Malachi, which simply means messenger or messenger of God, Malachi comes with a prophetic message to the people. That message is one that God wants them to understand. That for thousands of years, He's been pouring that John 3.16 love out to them. And we see the rest unfold in this book. So that is the passage, and that's the introduction. And I want to read to you, if I can, just the first few chapters. So stand with me in Malachi chapter 1. The oracle, the word of the Lord, to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them wicked, ter call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Heavenly Father, I pray that you have God to direct us to understand this passage. I pray, Father, that we will discern <coughs> your love from this passage towards us. I pray, Father, we'll also have to come face to face with how our love is demonstrated back. Father, I believe that's what your messenger had for the people. And that was his message here. And specifically, it was to the priests, Lord. So help us to understand who this audience is for today. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now what follows in this passage is then Malachi's... Now he's told them about God's love, right? He said basically God's love is it's unmerited. God's love is 
it, in, in a sense, and in every sense actually, it, it, it's not because you've earned His love. There's not enough good doing, no matter how good we are, to deserve the love of God. It's not enough. But God's love is also unchanging. I love the term immutable, but that simply means unchanging. God's love, it doesn't, it doesn't matter when I'm doing good or when I'm doing bad. God doesn't go, I love Him more now and I love Him less then. God's love is unconditional. It's unchanging. It also tells us uh, in, in God's words here at the beginning through the prophet Malachi that God's love is universal. It's for all of us. And that's amazing to me because although uh, God loves us all equal, and we sang that even in the song, you know, whether it's the poor or the, the strong or the rich or the weak or whatever, God's love is for all of us. And that blows my mind. But in this passage, there's a, a, an, in, an intentional term. Verse 5 says, Your eyes will see this, and you will say, The Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. So there you see His love going out. Now when His love goes out, there's an intentionality that the people would carry it. Hey, God has loved us for thousands of years. We've received His love. We've been the recipient of His love. And yet as we go forward and we go out, what is the result? If you have a Bible like mine, you'll see the passage title of this section that follows the sin of the priest. It's so I want to be clear before we start where the priests start. In the Old Testament, there was a tribe that God had chosen, the Levitical tribe, the Levites. God had chosen them to be a priest to the people, and it was their job to lead the other nations, the other tribes. But here today, in the New Testament, the second covenant of God, you, church, are the priesthood of believers. When God tore open the veil in that room and He gave His message of hope and salvation to all people, all of us received the opportunity to stand in the Holy of Holies with the Lord and to stand before Him because of what Jesus did. So when Jesus' blood was shed on the cross and He was resurrected from the tomb, you became His priest to the world. And so Malachi goes forward. And he, he begins to talk about what's wrong with the people. And us today, we, when we read this, we need to ask ourselves, where am I in this priestly line of things? Am I doing it well? Am I doing it poorly? Do I need improvement? Where am I on this list? And so Malachi begins in verse 6. And the first point, if I can with you, is to share this. Honor. You just want to write honor down. Because I believe the first thing he attacks in the people in his prophetic message is how they honor God. And there is a specific way that God's priesthood, his people, that are taking his message out, there's a certain way we should honor God. He says in verse 6, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how we despise your name. You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? And then you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. And I see here two things. That the priests did not honor through their altars. You know, an altar was just a place where they took the time to worship God. And if we're honest today in our society, our Christian society especially, there are many who spend no time at all finding a place that is their altar. A place where they would stop and worship God. Our schedules are too busy. Or work too much. Or God just hasn't revealed Himself. Or God hasn't yet told me where that altar should be. But Malachi is saying to the priest, hey, God is the one that deserves honor, not you deserving a special place for Him. God is the, pur the purpose and the point at which you should offer that worship to Him. The second thing I see is that the priests did not honor through their actions. Now there was a lot going on at this time, but one of the worst tragedies was the priests who would receive the blessings that were given by the people. Their, their purpose was to cut off the best parts and to put them in a pot and to cook them properly with the way the law that God had given them said. And then to take it into the place, a temple, and to offer it as an incense to the Lord. This is how God had advised them to do. 
And instead of doing that, they were cutting off the worst stuff, the fat and the, the bile, whatever else. And they were cooking that. And they were taking to their home the very best stuff. Now, listen, it didn't matter that God wasn't going to eat it. He wasn't going to taste it. What mattered was they were breaking the Word of God. They were saying that they were doing one thing, and they were living a completely different thing. It doesn't matter who you say you are. It matters who you are in the eyes of God. And in this moment, in this time, as we go forward into the world, in the tragedy and the discomfort of this world, where in, in Houston now, a man can walk into a lady's restroom at any time because he just wants to. In California, the same can happen. We live in a place today where the government of our country can say to pastors, I want your messages on the Word of God, and I'm going to critique them to see if you're doing it right. Hey, I got news for you. If you want my messages, I'm going to send you this, and I'm going to say start at the left side and go all the way to the right side. Here's the messages of God. And that's what I preach. And I know that they're doing that there. But we live in a country where that can happen now. We said it would never happen in our society. Many of you in all generations have served to protect a nation that had a constitution that governed our freedoms. And as the world continues to crack down on our freedoms and, and it gets tougher and tougher to be a Christian and for you young people to stand up today in a society in which you're told that what you believe is, is old and archaic. You had better know who you are, not just profess to be someone who you are not. And Malachi came into a place where they just didn't care about God anymore. If you go back into the other prophets, they call them minor prophets, but they're not minor because they had less to say. They're just minor because they're shorter books. That's our words. But these prophets of God were telling the people at the time, hey, God's temple has been destroyed. Why are you rebuilding your house? That's Haggai. Why are you building your house when God's house is yet to be built? They're, to, they're, they're, they're prophesying to the people, quit building false gods. Quit worshiping other things. We live in a society today where houses are worshipped, where the type of vehicles we drive are worshipped, where the people that we're friends with are worshipped, and we never stop to say, God, how can I worship you better? But boy, we have more opportunity today than we've ever had. You talked about, and we know about, the incredible month of October. And it's tiring to do that work. I told my wife last night, after all the walking around the last month, all the extra stuff, the lifting, the carrying, and then the regular work day, said, I know all of you have too. We are tired. My legs are wore out. My knee hurts here. My calf hurts there. Broken, but happy. Because we have shared the Word of God. Saturday coming up, my body isn't looking forward to it, but my heart and my mind are excited about 2,000 people or so coming to our church and us getting to love each one of them. If we put out the hand of Christ, if we extend who we are to Him, God is going to be able to do great things, mighty things, I believe. But if we can sit back and we just say, hey, you know what? I've already done a lot. I'm a little tired. I really need to sleep. It's been a rough week. If we let ourselves get caught up, we're just like Israel. See, they were all caught up in their own situation. They were caught up in their family. They were caught up in what was going on. I want to, somebody's texting me. My mother. <laughs> You're going to watch this, Mom, on the internet, and you're going to be like, oh my. <laughs> it, is, it, is, well, it is kind of an emergency. My, my little niece in, in the Ukraine, in Odessa, to be specific, shut the door on her thumb this morning, and broke her thumb. And so my little Becca is hurting right now. And uh, my mom just give me an update. There you go, mom. We're praying for you. Becca, we love you. Um, Charles Spurgeon said this. If God had been weary of us, we need not have wondered. But we ought to blush and be silent for shame because we have wearied of Him. That's good stuff. 
Are we tired of God? If not, how is it that we do not walk with Him from day to day? Really, spiritual worship is not much cared for in these days. Even by professing Christians, many will go to a place of worship if they can be entertained with fine music or grand oratory. But if communion with God is the only attraction, they are not drawn thereby. So let me say that in our words. It's interesting that he says that in his, but it's so relevant today. We're willing to come if we're entertained. But we find it very hard to come if it's just to focus on God's work. And this is what matters. And that's Malachi's message. The second thing I see in this passage, starting verse 8, is, is not just honor, but offering. God addresses through Malachi to his people offering. In verse 8 it says this, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer to your governor? I turn that off. I've never carried my phone. Sorry. Why not offer it to your governor? Would you have been pleased with you, or would you receive? Would he receive you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts. But now will you not entreat God's favor that He may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on the altar. <coughs> I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. So what he's saying is this. What you give me is, is not any worth compared to what you give even the government. We will not miss work, but we will miss church. We will not miss work, but we will miss ministry. We will give to others, but we will not give to God our offering. Now, offering is much more than the money you put in the pot. In fact, I think it's far easier to drop a few dollars in a plate than it is to drop a few hours of service to the Lord. I think it's far easier to do just a little bit than to do a lot of it. But God defines us by what we give as offering to Him. That's why Paul says in Romans, submit yourselves as an offering before God. He says it's your spiritual act of worship. He says in another way, it's your normal or your average act of worship. It's not a great thing for God to expect us to offer ourselves to Him. Listen, parents, can I tell you this? If we had a different view, if we had this view in mind, of our teenagers, when we send them out into the world, the Bible even refers to the fact that we shoot them out like arrows into the world as missionaries to a dying and a lost world. If we had that in mind as we raised them, instead of discussing with them the things that are going on in our lives or our disappointments with others, if we would just shoot them out in the world like Christ's messengers, then God would move mightily through the church. But the church is silent. And the reason is, because we've gotten ourselves to a point where we just look around and we think, hey, things are okay. Things are not so bad. I've got a good future. I'm building something special here. And I'm satisfied with that. But the reality is, folks, that God doesn't want to satisfy. I look through the Scriptures. I read through the Bible. I pray you're doing the same. Tell me one person in Scripture who says, man, this stuff is easy. You've got me to do it. God, I can't wait to do the next thing. There's just not anyone like that in the Bible. They're all being beaten down. Paul said the best. He said, hey, Jesus, I'm wearing the scars because of my service to you. Church, I say, where are our scars? Where are our scars? A few sore knees and calves and whatever else. Praise God. Let's keep on. You can't tell me it's easy to leave our children. Especially not the size that we have. You can't tell me last week, 39 children in Children's Church. You can't tell me it's easy to organize a group that size. But today, the messengers of our Children's Church, not beyond the point of saying, hey, we need bigger rooms if we're going to do 39 kids at a time. Their message was, praise God, bring them on. Awesome. Awesome, church. <coughs> So he says to him, you wouldn't give to your government what you offer me. 
Then he says to them, your offerings, hey, they're not important because no matter how much you give, you're not giving it with the right attitude. He said, they mean nothing to me because of your attitude. You see, we can't be doing it and then looking at next door to see what Mr. and Mrs. Smith are doing and saying, well, I'm giving more than them, so I'm good. Because God hasn't called you to compete. God's called you to serve. So when I present my offering, if it's the very best thing I can give the Lord, the Lord's going to be satisfied no matter what the size of it is compared to the person next to me. In fact, I really shouldn't even know what the person next to me is doing if I'm focused on God. Amen. Our offerings are what God intends for us to give. You tell me you're giving enough, I believe you because I trust God. And I know that God has a way of bringing about through His people His will. You tell me, well, Kurt, preach more on money, we'll get more money. I tell you this, if I preach your heart right with Christ, if you get straight with the Lord, you're going to give more because you're more in tune with the Lord's will. That's how God's church grows. Malachi's going to tell us kind of some boundaries and some guidelines here in a few weeks. I'll preach those. But the reality is, if your heart is right with God, you're going to want to give. You're going to see it as not my 10% that I'm giving away, but his 90 that he's letting me keep. That's how we're going to see it. But even more so, you're going to see your time as a beautiful offering to the Lord. The more we serve together, by the way, even Ben, I was telling you this yesterday, we pick up a speaker together. The first one you carry by yourself. Wish I could still do that. The second time I said, Ben, let's do it together. We're joking as we walk along. I said, now see if we get to fellowship while we're carrying it together. He's like, oh yeah, that's talking, right? Yeah, that's fellowship. We get to do it together, man. I love it. Now, we were just joking, but that is really a picture of the church. God wants us offering together because we're going in the same direction. If we go in the same direction, then He's going to be honored. Our offering is going to recur in the third thing, service. How do I do it for the Lord? And I see in verse 12 something uh, uh, interesting to finish up this chapter. But you are profaning it. In that you say this, the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruits, its food is despised. So the table of God, the offerings that you bring are despised because you're doing it with the wrong purpose, you're doing it for the wrong service reasons. In verse 13 it says this though, you also say, my, how tiresome it is. And boy, I bet some of us have said that. I'm just too tired to go. But if we're defined by going in our tired moments, because it is an offering and a service to God, and how will we be seen by God in our going and serving? <clears throat> it goes on to say in verse 13, And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick. You see, in that time too, they were supposed to take their best uh, cow or their best pig or whatever else, or not pig maybe, but their best thing. And they were supposed to bring it before the Lord, but instead of doing that, they'd cure out the, the weakest one from their herd, and they would take it in. And God does not get tricked by us. If you think you're hiding something from God, <coughs> the sadness, not the joke, is on you. God knows you better than you. After all, He created you. He wove you together, the Bible says in Psalms. And so when we bring that, that least thing or what doesn't matter to us and offer it to God, if it doesn't hurt you, if it doesn't mean something to you, how can you imagine it would mean something to a holy and mighty God? A God who's all-powerful. A God who wove you, wove all creation together. If you can't give your best in your service and attitude and how you work with others and all those things, then what can God do with it? The Bible says He just throw it off the table. So in verse 14, it goes on to say this. But cursed be the swindler, who has a male in his flock, and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. So we come full circle. From a God who loves us to a God who recognizes that although his love is perfect, that we have not received it perfectly. And he reminds us that he's this unbelievable, powerful God. And he says to us today, hey, Israel, you, you can come right now and begin to do these things often on serve. And you will be that small remnant 
who is doing it right. And so we, the church, stop and we look like in a mirror. And we say to ourselves, is this who I am? Or is this who I am? The one who serves and honors and offers the right and perfect thing to the Lord. You're not offering what you could be. You're offering who you are. God will take that and he will make it. <coughs> And you are special, and you are perfect for the work that God intended you to be for. He doesn't need you to be the best at this or the best at that. He just needs you to be willing. And He will mold and guide and direct us into who He desires to be. As we move forward, church, you have done much of this beautiful offering, this beautiful service, and done it for the Lord which is an honor. But this is our time for self-inspection during a busy time. To say to ourselves, Lord, even though we're a pretty outstanding church, we recognize that maybe we need to do some things more, some things different for God. And I want that to be our time of commitment. I want to read to you one more Charles Spurgeon. He says, when we listen to the reading of the Word of God and the preaching of His truth, shall that be a weariness? Yes, when we have no part or lot in it. When it's like reading a will in which we have no legacy. But if the Gospel be preached as our Gospel, the Gospel of our salvation, and we have a share in it, what can so inspire us so much more? See, it's what you put in. Why was... Our ministry last week so amazing. You sold out to God. We worshiped strongly. We participated well. Joined together. We do the same today. Ultimately, God is looking at each of you to present yourselves as a living sacrifice to Him. When you do that, He will order your life in every way. By the way, it won't be easy, but it will be an awesome journey. Stand with me. As our worship team comes to share with us in our time of commitment, I just want to challenge you, church. This is our day. It's our time to say, you know what? I don't care what other people think. I've got things I need to work on. Come down here and pray. Come down here and give it back to God if you've been holding on to it. Or maybe you just... You want to make God Lord of your life. If that's the case, you come down here and you just say, Kirk, I want to make God Lord in my life. Maybe you want to make this church your home. You just come down and say, hey, I want to make this my home church and be a part of what God's doing. Whatever it is, don't go home the same as you came. Or else we fail to do together what God's called us to do individually. As they lead us in a time of commitment, you come forward as you